uh, good morning, everyone. Um, those of you who are viewing this via Zoom or via our YouTube live stream, welcome to the second day of ICCS3. Ito po yung first panel natin for the second day. Okay, so this is panel 12 uh, with a the theme, Indigenous Customary Law. My name is Gracian Miklai. I am from UP Baguio, and I will be the med moderator for this panel. Um, we also have in this room, Mr. Jeffrey Javier, our assistant moderator. Uh, should you have any technical problems, kindly direct your message to him. Okay, that was a brief reminder to the participants po before we start. Uh, you have received your conference kits, which detail the conference flow as well as the do's and don'ts during the Zoom meetings. And this was also flashed earlier while we were waiting. But let me reiterate only a few. So kindly mute your microphones when you are not speaking and turn off your video cameras if you have poor internet connect uh, connection. If you wish to ask a question also, you may type it in the chat box and I will be reading them after all the presentations are done. If you want to ask your question verbally, Later on, please use the Zoom functions at the bottom of your screen to raise your hand and wait for me to call on you to speak. Okay, so we will queue you. Uh, just like in the previous panels, we will hold the Q&A after all the presentations are played. So these are all uh, pre-recorded. Uh, in this panel, we have four paper presentations today and most of our presenters are already in the room. So please do not hesitate to send me your questions while the presentations are ongoing or after you have viewed the presentations. You may also send your questions to me via direct message. You can uh, search for my name there in the, uh, in the chat box. Okay, so if you want to re remain anonymous, I will not be reading your names, but I will be reading your questions in the allotted time that we have after all the presentations have been played. Okay. So uh, let me just introduce our first speaker. All right, so our first speaker is uh, Teresa May E. Gallardo. She's an assistant professor, six teaching CAS 1, Mindanao Studies, and PI100 at the University of the Philippines, Mindanao. She earned her bachelor's degree in history at Mindanao State University, uh, Iligan Institute of Technology in Iligan City. She is also a graduate of Master of Arts in Islamic Studies and Doctor of Philosophy in History, both from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Her professional interests include local history, Muslims in the Philippines and Philippine history. Professor Gallardo will be talking about Panghusay, mediation, among Higaunon tribe of Bukidnon, concepts, processes, and cases. All right, let's play for her presentation, Sir, Sir Jeffrey. Good morning, everyone. So this will be my paper entitled Paghusay or Mediation Among Higaunon Tribe of Bukidnon, Concepts and Practices. I am Teresa May E. Gallardo from uh, University of the Philippines, Mindanao, under the uh, Department of Social Sciences. Uh, the outline of my presentation is uh, the following. First one is an introduction, followed by uh, the objective of the study, and then a very brief overview of the Higaunon tribe, uh, about the tribe itself and its customary law, and then uh, Bukidnon, and then Paghusay mediations, uh, the essential concept in understanding their way of settling conflict, and then of course uh, the ritual uh, that involved in the Paghusay, and then case studies uh, from killings, uh, murder, land and resources conflict, and of course family. And then conclusion, and then followed by uh, the references that were used in the study. The study intends to, uh, to discuss about the concept and practices of the indigenous ways in conflict resolution among the Higaunon tribal community of Bukidnon. Uh, the study was initiated for the two following reasons. First one, Higaunon tribe as an indigenous tribe is not well known, is not that well known. Uh, most of the time, um, uh, indigenous tribes in Luzon uh, are considered the most studied tribes in the Philippines. And then second one is uh, in terms of settling conflicts, they have these processes which is still homegrown. 
No matter what kind of conflict arises, it could be mediated and settled between two involving parties uh, through the palaghusay without going through a process like that of uh, the mainstream Philippine judicial system. This study is a descriptive, qualitative uh, research that heavily relies on uh, literatures and documents that were gathered uh, during uh, fieldwork uh, from NCIP and then uh, several museums in Region 10, particularly in Xavier Museum. And then I also did conduct interview from staffs and employees of uh, non-government uh, organizations and then NCIP and then uh, Xavier in Xavier Museum as well. Uh, the word higa unun came from uh, three words. First one is higa, which means to live or to reside. The second one, gaun, which means one who ascends the mountains from coastal plains. And the third word, uh, unun, means people. Therefore, the word higa unun is the people of the living mountains. Uh, their food supply was based on hunting, uh, fishing, and swiden agriculture. So they belong to a large and diverse population living in the forested interior plains and mountains of northern Mindanao, uh, uh, particularly in the provinces of Misamis Oriental, Agusan del Norte, Agusan del Sur, Bukidnon, and Lanao del Norte. Uh, the Higa Unon can be classified into three categories. So the first one is... Uh, the one who strictly adhere to their customary law, the Bungatul Habulawa ng Katasa Halana's Teaching and Discipline, or the Code of Conduct. They live in the thick forest in the semi-settled communities, subsisting on wild games, fishing, root crops, rice, and trading of forest products and handicrafts. So their social organization is still that social system instituted during the earliest Dumalongdong with a very slight modification made to suit contemporary times. Uh, the category 2, the Higaunun who fall under category 2, are slowly moving toward assimilation. Although they still live in the teaching of their uh, Bungatul Habulawan, uh, however, their laws, their traditions, their culture, their social system of the majority of the people, of the Filipino people, already have exerted a very strong influence on their lives. Lastly, uh, the third category are those Higaunon who have assimilated into uh, the Filipino majority. Some have become professionals and hold position in the government. So these people still identify themselves as Higaunon and in solidarity with their people in their struggle for self-determination. The Higaunon, despite of the age of globalization, the Higaunon people, uh, they have still high veneration of spirits. Uh, their native intermediary is called Bailan or Serwano, uh, so uh, between man and the spirit. Uh, they also follow Datu ship system of governance. So the Datu or the chieftain leads the Higaunon people. He should be articulate in their customary law. And then he has this integrity and sincerity eh, to rule his Gaup. His Gaup refers to a Datu's area and where the spears of his influence reign. So he should also protect his people and strive hard so they would not be oppressed ensuring the unity and welfare of his people. So, uh, the Datu and his Gaup should follow the customary law of Bungatul Habulawan Dao Nangka Tasa Halana, which simply means the treasured unity and code of conduct. And the secret teachings uh, under this customary laws, law were taught in the form of sacred order. And the sacred orders were enumerated as follows. First one is don't go against the law. So they should have to follow uh, their customary law, their balaud. Uh, they should not disobey their sacred orders. Uh, and higa unun should not be an egoistic or self centered person. They should also not compare themselves to others. And then they should not also be envious to others. And then asking and giving is the greatest gift of the creation. So if you if you don't have you you can ask, 
but if you have you can give to those who who ask and then uh they should love one another for them to live in peace and for them to live in peace they have to remind themselves that they are uh they are equal with one another even men and women and they should listen to everyone not only for their elders for their datus but the entire go the entire component of the go okay so uh the paghusay or the mediation uh we will be learning here the essential concepts uh in understanding uh uh the higaunan way on settling uh their conflict and then of course the ritual processes that involve uh this paghusay and several case studies the paghusay or the mediation uh this is uh the higaunan ways of settling conflicts uh, conflicts must be addressed uh, by the higaonon uh, to restore good relationship and for them to forgive each other. So, however, this, uh, this uh, paghusay is not only limited to conflicts and feud, but it also encompasses uh, negotiations of a contract like, for example, marriage. Uh, the datu will act as the palag the ref. So the Higaunons, uh, the Higaunon community really decided uh, and if the Higaunon will not adhere on peace, uh, they will be generalized as magahat or outlaw. So uh, they will be considered as a social cancer to the society. And then to maintain social order, uh, there is a certain or set of laws that is called balaod. And this balaod is integrated with the performance of rituals so this balaod forms part of the social control mechanism for the maintenance of order and harmony in the higaunon society so uh laws uh part of this balaod were not uh were orally transmitted from generation to generation and they were not eaten so they were considered as religious laws uh that originated from the beliefs of their supreme being uh, and handed to Higaonon ancestors like Apo Pabulawan, Apo Lagaulan, and Apo Agawan. The Higaonon ancestors and had to invoke the Balaod guided by the spirits called Lalawag Unguli. Here is uh, the major component of the Balaod, uh, the golden rule, the Bungatol Habulawan, or uh, it symbolizes maayong batasan or the good attitude and the parable of one cup of oil uh, that uh, states when it overflows it means that you have violated the law or may have offended others the other one is the concept of uh, the brotherhood uh, panag igsunay batasan or attitude usually employed in mediating conflict involving blood relatives and then batasan hulido this is a law governing conflicts involving murder and then panos respect for another person so if you want something from the others you have to ask permission that is panos and then uh, the higaunon really believes on the gaba or the negative consequences of a sala or sin uh, this is a some sort of punishment or for misdemeanor there are two kinds of conflict uh, usually common among higaonon community so the first one is the minor conflict or the lumbu bulawan uh, these conflicts uh, do not involve blood relatives and then the serious or the major conflict or the anipalido or the murder and adultery in conflict that usually involve blood relatives. This is the usual uh, ritual process uh, that is part of the paghusay. Uh, the first one is the mediation, so uh, involvement of the two parties or the two feuding parties. So this could either but this could either be done uh, by the feuding parties or either the relatives of the feuding parties uh, approaching uh, the datu or any elder of the community. Uh, they have to determine why and how it happened, uh, why the conflict and 
why the conflict happened and how it happened. A uh, part of this mediation is the payment of mangad. So mangad is either in the form of uh, money, cash, or kinds. Kind usually a property or an animal, carabao horses, or other valuable items. So uh, the value of the mangad is determined by the agreed party. So, uh, in most cases, uh, because of the desire of the Datu to resolve the conflict, they are the ones who look for the Mangad, or they will also be the one to provide for themselves for the ritual process to begin. Uh, this particularly happens if the offending parties cannot offer anything to the aggrieved party. So, that is one of the reasons why, why a Datu cannot, uh, would never get rich. And then, because of the cause of the mangad, uh, usually uh, became a cause of uh, the delay of of ending the conflict. So the power of uh, the mangad is a form of retribution rather than a confinement to the offender. So uh, the elders believe that it possesses a certain gahum or powers that will serve as an effective deterrent to anyone who plans to commit any mistakes. So, um, uh, the payment of mangad and is not the end of the process in settling a conflict, rather that is an initial step. The most important process is the performance of the rituals. So, from Singampo to the Witan, but, it does, but it's not necessarily that all uh, paghusay should involve all these ritual processes. Singampo is a prayer, so before the, the start of paghusay is... Uh, an offer, uh, a prayer is offered by Idatu uh, to uh, the uh, to the uh, feeding parties, and then of course uh, to the spirit who will form part of uh, in settling the conflict. And then second one is Tampuda. Here in Tampuda is the ceremonial cutting of rattan. So they need materials like, for example, rattan and a lamb chicken. And then they also prepare a hole that they dig before the ritual. Uh, begins and then right after the tampuda is the signing of the limbai the lighting of the torch uh, the torch the light of the torch symbolizes the end of the conflict so yung signing of limbai usually uh, assisted by the wife of the datu uh, in pan lito uh, uh, this ritual uh, encompasses uh, the calling of uh, important spirits like for example ibabasok Talabugta, uh, Pamalayag, and then pan, Panumanod, uh, they are the spirits that invoke to finally end to the conflict and to arrest further complications. Uh, these spirits were asked to restore the good relationship between the two parties. And then, uh, during the Panlitob also, all the materials that were used uh, during Tampuda will be buried uh, during the panlito process. And then another one is Pagimukod. This is another prayer offered to uh, to the feeding parties and of course uh, to uh, uh, the spirits and then of course the Witan. The Witan is a final blessing uh, giving good health to uh, two feeding parties and then of course long life. As what, ha as what I have stated earlier, the mediator or the palagusa is usually conducted by the Datu. But if two feuding parties are both Higaunons, but if there is a non-Higaunon part of that uh, feuding party, usually uh, they require the presence of the barangay official. So if the Datu will be the one... Uh, who will serve as palagusay, usually uh, there will be no written records and then uh, they will not allow anymore for the feuding party to side of the story because at first they, the Datu already knew how and what happened why the conflict arises. Uh, if the barangay official requires their presence, uh, there will be a secretary to document the proceedings and then two parties were given time to tell their stories that basically led to uh to the to the uh tedious uh trial and then expensive uh and then of course the guilty party must go to jail unless there is an agreement of the payment for blood money okay so these are several uh, several uh pictures that will show 
on how palaghusay works, particularly on the performance of the rituals. Okay, from these three studies, uh, uh, it was taken from, uh, uh, the study was conducted by Balay Pierce. It's an NGO from situated or located in uh, Cagayan, de Oro, Cagayan de Oro City. Okay, there was a certain killing. This is a family, uh, family, um, uh, family conflict that involves killing or murder, wherein um, uh, the case proceeding, uh, the conflict ended with uh, with the performance of ritual and then of course uh, the payment of mangad. And then the other one is a land and resources conflict. Uh, it shows here that in case proceeding, uh, there were also performance of panlitob, and then of course um, gimukod also. Um, uh, the preparation of the mangad, it's either uh, from this one is uh, uh, is in kind. So, uh, this is another form of land encroachment conflict uh, that is outside of that is outside of Bukidnon, somewhere in Agusan del Norte, Gingoog, and in Claveria. So, uh, a ritual was conducted, Singampo, and then they were attended by representative. Uh, representative from uh, uh, the areas of the involved boundary conflict and then of course NGO and then uh, from NCIP also. This is another form of a family conflict and the conflict ended with uh, the performance of uh, the Paghusay wherein the Datu advised to restore, advised the couple to restore their relationship and then of course the performance of uh, important rituals like for example panlitob and paggimukod and then the other one is a family it's a family conflict again something to do about marriage uh, there was a payment of manga just to to address the conflict just to end the conflict and then on the girl's part uh, they uh, the girl was able to give bracelet uh, that is made of beads to the boy's parent so in conclusion paghusay is the means for the higaonon to end whatever conflicts arises within the community so whether it is a minor or major conflict so paghusay up until today uh, plays a very important role in maintaining the peace and order of the tribe. However, in the present generation, uh, the younger Higaonons prefer settling conflicts on local based on Philippine judicial system uh, that is a threat to a long historical process of Higaonon ways on uh, Paghusay. So these are the sources or references that were used that were used in writing of this paper, um, uh, documents, literatures coming from Balay Mindanao, uh, from Xavier University, uh, Xavier Museum, uh, the United Association of Riga Unon Tribes, and several books and journals that were also used for this uh, paper. Thank you for listening and good day once again. Okay, thank you, Professor Galliardo. We will proceed with our second paper presentation, so we will have more time for the Q&A later on. So the second paper presentation entitled The Budong Indigenous Allied Group, Biag, Observing an Indigenous Customary Law in a Non-Indigenous Context, is authored by two professors from UP Los Baños. Uh, Raydan M. Pawilen is an assistant professor from the Department of Social Sciences, CAS UP Los Baños. He obtained his bachelor's degree in social sciences, major in history and minor in political science from UP Baguio. He also earned his MS in geography from UP Diliman. He is currently taking PhD in history in UP Diliman. Ryan Alvin M. Pawilen is also an assistant professor from the Department of Social Sciences, College of Arts and Sciences, CAS, UP Los Baños. He earned his bachelor's degree in social sciences major in social anthropology and minor in psychology from UP Baguio. He earned his MA in Philippine studies from UP Diliman. He is currently taking PhD in history in UP Diliman also. All right, so let's listen to their presentation, Sir Jeffrey.
Good day, magandang araw, and naimbag nga aldaw tayo amin. I'm Ryan Alvin Pawilan with my uh, brother and colleague Raydan Pawilan, and we're both uh, representing the Department of Social Sciences, College of Arts and Sciences, University of the Philippines, Los Baños. This presentation is about the Budong Indigenous Allied Group, or BIAG, or simply Budong, as uh, it is called by its members and the application of customary laws in non-indigenous context. This is based on our data for our separate thesis in our specific master's degrees. Specifically, we wanted to examine some historical context of the modern-day Budong in Ilocosur, then analyze the methods of the Budong indigenous allied group using legal geography perspective. First, we look at some definitions like customary laws, which is basically rules accepted by the community on how to behave and then how to address certain misbehaviors. In some ways, their application to resolve issues outside formal legal courts and their principles of restoration and amendment of social relationships goes hand in hand with what we call alternative dispute resolution methods. Thus, uh, it is something not really foreign for uh, non-indigenous uh, people and uh, non-indigenous uh, framework. In fact, we can also consider the junctions of the two concepts if we are to apply customary laws outside the community, which is also being done by the BIAG. This is the most notable difference of the Budong of Ilocosur versus the Budong in Kalinga. The Budong in Ilocosur started as Saranay and Padang. Saranay pertains to the communal act of helping those in need. Padang, on the other hand, was the indigenous term for peace pact. The community in Ilocosur is predominantly composed of itnags. Okay, so what were the important events no, that shaped the formation of BIAG? First, we have the internal agreement among members to adopt a more legal and benevolent approach in doing alternative dispute resolution following the incidents in Santa Maria and Salcedo Ilocosur during the late 1980s, wherein members of BSA um, had uh, a few misunderstandings with um, members no, of the Ilocano community in the said areas. The second important event is the enactment of IPRA in 1997. So it was a game changer because it provided a legal backdrop for the continued practice of the Budong. And also, it led to the formal adaptation of the name Budong since it was specified in the document. The third is the registration of the group to the Securities Exchange Commission on March 26, 1998. So to add legality you know, to the uh, Biagasan organization. And the uh, name was formally changed from Budong Saranay Association or BSA to Budong Indigenous Allied Group or Biag. Okay. And uh, the registration to the Security and Exchange Commission required the group to write its own constitution and bylaws. And um, this is just a, a trivia, uh, but um, the Budong no, uh, in Ilocosur is independent from the Budong in Kalinga. Though there are instances wherein observers from the Budong in Kalinga come to Ilocosur to observe the Budong there. The change of name from Saranay and Padang to Budong is actually just because of their perceived legal convenience. They believe that in order to expedite the formal recognition of the practice and group, the use of the term Budong as stipulated in the IPRA would be advantageous. Thus, it was not really the Budong as practiced in Kalinga that was adopted, only the name. Nevertheless, the indigenous practices based on Saranay and Padang were the underlying concepts of the organization. 
the Budong in Kalinga shares the concept of creating bonds between communities. It is done by elders through a series of rituals and the acceptance of the bylaws or agreed upon rules called Pagta. The rules apply only to the members and the participating communities. Issues can result to the solution of the budong, warfare, or other traditional methods. For the budong in Ilocos, however, the bond is created between any individual and extends only to the immediate family. There is already a written bylaws which aspiring members should adhere and the application is through recommendation and screening process. Issues with the members result to fines or expulsion from the group. However, the application of the budong is also applied to non-indigenous and non-budong members. As reflected in the objectives of the group, the organization aims to provide protection and a means to seek justice for the members who are abused or denied of their rights. These are attained through peaceful means as the organization also sees itself as a partner of the government, meaning it will also operate within the modern legalities such as coordination with the LGUs during rallies. Membership was uh, originally exclusive for the indigenous people. But recently, according to the key informants, it has been open to those who are willing to follow the rules. Again, the application is through a form, then a screening process. The accepted members enjoy saranay during weddings, sickness, or death, and additional protection in case of injustice. This will also be enjoyed by their immediate family, and in case of death of members, the membership can be assumed by the spouse or the firstborn child. Membership is irregardless of sex or gender. The duties include attendance to meetings, payment of dues, protection of the reputation of the group, and the participation to rallies. Rallies here pertains to the mass gathering and occupation of space by the members of the Budong in order to obtain justice. So uh, in terms of governance, so there are two levels to the BIAG uh, organization. So we have the federated level, okay, the highest okay, uh, level of uh, the BIAG organization. And these are the uh, positions. And uh, the same goes to the chapter level. Okay. So we have different chapter presidents. Okay. And uh, they also have special positions for uh, screeners. Okay, and uh, lupons. Okay, and uh, this is the basically this is the uh, flow no, of the uh, BIAG alternative dispute resolution method. So basically, it is a um, it is a way to settle conflicts and cases before they are raised for to formal formal courts. And according to our respondents, um, they encourage actually the members that uh, that bef before um, before uh, raising their cases to biag they have to consult first with the barangay lupon okay as a respect as a sign of respect uh, to state uh, authorities so if the barangay lupon fails then the um, biag chapter can, can step in okay and intervene no? And then the Biag Chapter Screening Committee will evaluate the case and recommend it for Biag Chapter Mediation. If the Biag Chapter me Mediation fails, then the Biag Chapter would then um, transfer the case to the Biag Federated Screening Committee case 
for evaluation and um, then it will the fed, federated screening committee will recommend the case to for biag occupation so if the biag occupation fails then uh, the case may be raised to formal courts okay if it succeeds then um, the responsibility of um, of following up now on the case and monitoring the progress of the case returns to the biag chapter okay so in here we have a uh, map of biag chapters in the locus or in abra as well as a population map of Santa Maria Ilocos or chapter. Okay, so the membership of Budong has been continuously growing through the years. And by 2018, there were 34 uh, chapters. Uh, 31 chapters were located in um, Ilocos uh, Most of them are located no, at the upland municipalities. And the two chapters are located in Abra. Then we have a chapter in Milan, Italy. And uh, in the near future, uh, these chapters will increase no? uh, because of the nature of membership. Now, if you look at the population map of Santa Maria, uh, you may notice that um, membership for Santa Maria is not exclusively for, for the town only, you know, for town members. No? So we can see that there are also, members from San Esteban, Narbacan, Santa, and Bantay. And if these individuals in the near future are able to recruit members in their respective towns, then they may also establish their own chapters. Okay, and um, this also reflects the fluid character of the jurisdiction of Biag because it is not defined by geographical boundaries but it is defined by membership so if the biag have members in bulacan for example or in mindoro they may go to these places no in case there are uh, violations that are committed against these members from these places okay so we have here a map of the cases settled by Biag from 2012 to 2017 at the federated level. So all in all, they were able to settle uh, 35 cases. And uh, with the growth of membership of Biag, um, there was also an increase in the complexity of cases that, uh, that were being handled no, by the group. And this is um, one of the good things about Piag, because when a case is too complex to handle, they actually communicate uh, with the proper, the proper authorities who have the capacity to handle such cases. For example, uh, rape and also uh, murder. So in terms of uh, federated level intervention, uh, the BIAG uses the method of occupation as a means of forcing a negotiation. So what happens is that uh, members from different chapters converge uh, towards the area of residence of, a, uh, of an offending party. Okay, then uh, they will stay there until the offending party agrees no, to a, a dialogue. Okay. And um, of course, uh, if the offending party, uh, if the offending party's uh, residence is uh, within IP territory, then uh, there is no problem. So because Biag authority is recognized in these areas. However, if the offending party's uh, address is located somewhere else, then uh, there is a long process of negotiation between the Biag and the LGU concerned okay, for the Biag to uh, be able to conduct an occupation in non-IP areas. Okay. So if, a, if an occupation is successful, so this is the uh, document that is produced. So this is an agreement, so basically an agreement between the um, Biag as well as the offending party. Okay, so there is a detail no, regarding the case. 
uh, as well as the uh, damages and the agreed upon punishments. So this uh, this document is signed by uh, Biag official the Biag officials as well as uh, witnesses that are usually the barangay officials. So in conclusion, you would like to look at Biag as an atmospheric project. So this is, is a concept that was coined by David Delaney, so a geographer. And um, basically, this is one of the ways by which people um, negotiate you know, their legal environment. And um, with Biag, the enactment of IPRA it became an opportunity you know, to strengthen and also to integrate indigenous institutions such as the Budong within the legal spaces of the state. And also, it uh, became one of the factors by which the Budong was uh, remodeled okay, to a more modern, quote-unquote, version, okay, while maintaining its original functions, which is basically to serve as a judicial body for indigenous peoples in Ilocos or in Abra. And... Um, even with this remodeling, there is a manifestation of, or the continuous manifestation of customary laws. For example, of SAPIT, okay, through the settlement of cases, the way cases are settled, no, and how punishments are determined, as well as the Sintatako, no, through its idea of jurisdiction, uh, which is heavily based on membership and community. Okay, so... As a nomospheric project, uh, Budong is an institution that continues to challenge the boundaries of the state okay, and also the limits of the law. So that ends our presentation. Thank you very much for listening and we are more than happy to answer your questions later on. All right. Thank you, professors. Uh, let's proceed to our third paper presentation. Um, this is authored also by a group, so let me introduce them one by one. Okay, Maribel M. Gagto is a graduate of Doctor of Philosophy in Language at Benguet State University. She is the current Director for Accreditation and Quality Assurance of North Luzon Philippines State College and a faculty of the College of Teacher Education. Um, our second author is um, Marife Di Alviento. She is a graduate of Master of Development Administration at the Don Mariano Marcos Memorial State University Open University System. She has conducted researches on social sciences, which she presented in the local, regional, national, and international conferences. She is at present the OIC Director for Business, uh, for Research and Development of the College. A faculty, she is also a faculty of the, the Bachelor of Science in Business Administration program. Our last author um, is Eugene B. Dapshosen. He is a graduate of Master of Arts in Teaching Filipino at the University of Northern Philippines. His tertiary education is Bachelor in Secondary Education, major in Filipino at North Luzon Philippines State College in Candon City, Ilocos Sur. He is at present teacher one at the DepEd Candon City Division, Candon National High School in Candon City, Ilocos Sur. He's been a division trainer on uh, November 4 to 6, 2019. So let's leave presentation entitled Lipit, the Language of Discipline in Barangay Sarmingan, Narbacan, Ilocos Sur. Good day to each and everyone. Our study is all about traditional justice system, the language of discipline of the indigenous people. I'm Maribel Manzano Gagto from North Luzon, Philippines State College. Eugene Bidapiosen, that Ed Candon National High School. The Katarongang Pambarangay, as provided under Republic Act Number no. 7160, aims to settle disputes amicably at the lower level, so the intention that courts would be relieved of congestion, enhancing the quality of justice dispensed by them. On the other hand, the 1987 Philippine Constitution states that cultural communities have the right to use their own commonly accepted judicial system, conflict resolution processes that are compatible to the legal system of the country. Lipid justice system is a traditional method resolving conflicts and disputes within the barangay, particularly the imposition of discipline and penalizing people committing theft, adultery, 
fraud, abuse and violence causing by the undesirable noise through drunkenness and etc. According to the respondents, the DAP I symbolizes peace, unity and discipline in their community. It is an effective means of settling disputes and resolving conflicts. Even the young people, though their way of living are already influenced by the Western culture and modernization, the people in Sarmingan continue the observance of their culture and tradition. People die in Sarmingan, but their culture lives through generation according to them. This study aimed to learn the methods used in application of LIPIT, the traditional justice system of Barangay Sarmingan, Narva Kanilokusur. The objectives try to respond to the inquiries made by the researchers. Number one, to identify the procedures before the application of LIPIT to an individual. Number two, to describe the terms used in LIPIT justice system, specifically LIPIT, Paglipitan or Pagwaludan, Panglakayen, Dap Ayor Abong, Multa and the last one, Indigenous Peoples Officer or the IPO. Third, to determine the impact of Lipit justice system to the culture and identity of people in the community. And the last one, to distinguish the methods applied by the people in Sermingan in influencing the younger generations in preserving their identity and culture, especially in upholding the Lipit justice system. This study used the qualitative method of research design and the Filipino indigenous method, which refers to the various approaches used in generating research data. These methods are based on Filipino culture and conducted in the Philippine setting. In applying the indigenous method, you have to take cross-indigenous perspective in order to better understand the culture being studied. In analyzing the data, we use cultural relativism theory. It aims to understand the culture on its own terms and not to make judgment using the standards of one's culture. Narrative analysis as applied in this study use coding and interpretation, open coding, and selective coding. In the open coding, constant comparison and memoing were employed to treat the data to resolve the themes subcategories, and core categories. This was followed by the selective coding stage, which resulted in dense, saturated core categories. Purposive samplings was also used in the study. In a data gathering instrument, we used the abstracted method proposed scale by Enriquez, namely, pakikipagpentuhan, or chatting, second, pakikinig or listening, and the last one, tagtatanong, or asking question. As of the local and population of the study, Barangay Sarmingan is one of the 34 barangays of Narbacan situated in the borderline of Alakasir and Mountain Province, the only upland barangay in the municipality. They call themselves Kangana Ace, whom its ancestors' origin was in Mountain Province. Eleven residents served as the researchers' respondents' interviewee in the gathering of data. In the first statement of the problem, to identify the procedures before the application of lipids on individual, we come up with six things, namely, Letter A, complainants. An inquiry or an investigation against the respondents only commence when the victims formally files a complaint to the barangay officials. Letter B, investigation. The officers and other members of the jury need to possess the wisdom and right understanding to resolve cases with fair and impartial trial. And letter C, proven guilty may be punished or disciplined with liplit. The punishment to the person depends on how heavy the offense is. Letter D. Case brought uh, to the Philippine National Police. Not all cases are settled by the barangay officials and panglakayan. Terrible crimes are voluntarily succumbed to the police because they believe that lipid is not enough as punishment to the crime or violation. Letter E. Freedom of the offender. A person who is proven guilty of the crime and punished with lipid must show regret of his action and to correct the commission of his mistakes. And letter F, repentance or remorse. Before the awarding the freedom of the offender, he must be shown regret and repentance. Therefore, the barangay officials must continue learning about the traditional laws and its applications to so uphold the process of the traditional justice system and be a model to the next generation of the indigenous 
people. In the second statement of the problem, the language used meanings and objectives in the, per in the performance of the Lipid justice system, which symbolizes their culture and identity, we come up with five teams, namely... Number one, Panglakayen. The most senior in the community who is credible by his words and deeds. The roles are important and recognized. Number two, Lipid. The term represents an authority which serves as reminder to people not to do something against the law, but to follow rules in maintaining peace and crime-free barang barangay. Next, paglipitan or pagbaludan, an open prison to discipline individuals. Next, multa. As compensation to the commission of the crime serves as requirements before the offender gets his freedom. And last, the I o kay abo. It serves as the court during the inquiry and location of the paglipitan when the person is proven guilty. Therefore, we recommend that the great importance that parents in Sarmingan should continue to educate their children about the language of discipline of the Lipid justice system as a symbol of their identity and culture. The resident teachers in the barangay community may integrate the objectives of the traditional justice system on their assigned subjects such as Araling Palipunan, Sibikat Kultura, and other subjects in line with the K-12 curriculum. And in today's, in the state, third statement of the problem, the impact and influence of the Lipid justice system, which symbolizes people's culture and identity, we come up with five themes, namely... Number one, maintain peace and order. This is to establish, establish its purpose, the commission of crimes in the community, lessons in number. Next, avoid committing an offense. They obeyed any impertinence or rudeness but reverence to the people's lives. Net number three, exhibit cooperativism. People in the community practice cooperativism or extending any assistance to an offender. Number four, preserve values and discipline. Traditional justice scheme serves as their guide and not to become delinquent but turn them into a law-abiding citizens instead. And last, offenders learned their lesson. There are people who underwent into Lipid and shown changes on behavior and their relationship to the community. Therefore, we recommend that the local people in Sarmingan should continue to embrace and appreciate the traditional justice system in order to continue the peace and order program of the community. The younger generation should continue to preserve the form of justice system, share and disseminate to other people the relevance of it in upholding their identity and culture as one people. Lastly, to distinguish the methods applied by the people in Sarmingan to influence the younger generation in preserving their identity and culture, especially in upholding the Lipid justice system, we come up with two themes, namely... Giving importance to customary ways. The people embrace the culture and see the positive consequences to, to their ethnicity and share whatever education that other people may adopt based from their culture, cultural practices. And last, obligation to follow. The young people oblige to their laws and distinguishes the responsibilities that, that lies on their shoulder as future. Therefore, we recommend that the community of Sermingan is also encouraged to develop their museum to be used as display center of their indigenous resources and artifacts as their evidence of their history and preservation of culture. Other studies are encouraged to conduct by the other researchers to understand more about the indigenous people's tradition and culture. The conclusion were based from the findings of the study number one. The application of the traditional justice system in Barangay Sarmingan has six procedures to do before the execution of the lipid to the offender. Number two, the, term, the terms used in the procedure of lipid serves as instrument to introduce and describe the practice of the traditional justice system and the culture preserved in Barangay Sarmingan. Third, the traditional justice system of Sarmingan contributed to instill peace and order in the said barangay. The unique form of punishment become an, an, an identification to the people and to the community. And last, in order to preserve and uphold the identity, the barangay people, including the younger generation, should continue to embrace the traditional justice system despite the presence of presence of laws regarding human rights thank that's you, all man. and thank you very much god bless all right thank you very much also uh, let's move forward to our last presentation by mr alexander g kilip jr 
who finished his degree Master's in Public Administration at the University of Baguio. He is currently a social science teacher in the University of Baguio under the Senior High School Department. Mr. Killip's paper is entitled Traces of Ato as a Judicial Institution in the Lupon of Talubin Bontok Mountain Province. Hello everyone. Before I will start the presentation of my research, let me first introduce to you to one of the quotes of Heraclitus, which is the only constant in life is change. The meaning of this quote will be further understood while we'll be discussing the presentation of my research. Bontok Polity. According to Campbell, Bontok Polity is the contextualized existence of indigenous political institution and systematic political participation that is based on the customary laws which allows the indigenous people to achieve meaningful self-determination. Basically, in the context of Bonto, we call it the community pride or the concept of Sin Pangili. According also to Frilbrett, when we say Bontok Paliti, we can find here a village that is considered to be politically and economically autonomous from each other. Since village is considered to be the largest political institution. And village is composed of several atos or other villages called it ators. When we say ato, tracing back its history, it was believed to be instituted by Lumawig. When we say Lumawig, this is what we call the god of the Igorot, specifically in Mountain Province. It is a political institution, as cited by Fiarod and the Cordillera School Groups Incorporated, governed and controlled by Pueblo and provide political leadership. It is considered also to self-perpetuating. That is according to Jenks on his book that was published in 1905. And we have also here Anam Ama or Anam A. They are considered to be the judicial, legislative, and executive body of the village. So basically, the one who are governing the ato, which is the political institution of the barangay or the village, are the anama. Dispute settlement in the ato. Basically, when we are conducting researches about ato, we can easily find that one of the main importance of ato is dispute settlement. It is one of the reasons why it was created, to settle dispute in the village. And according to Miladen, when we're talking about Ato, dispute settlement and conflict management can be found in the framework of public administration. And basically, dispute settlement in the Ato is through arbitration. Now let's take a look on the paradigm of the study. So in order for us to fully understand the traces of Ato in the Lupon, we need to determine the different public administration practices and judicial practices of Ato that is currently being utilized by the Lupon. So under public administration practices, we need to highlight the processes in implementing policies and programs and the processes in evaluating policies and programs. Under judicial practices, we need to determine the process of conflict resolution and the process of imposing sanctions by the ATO that is currently being utilized by the loophole. And the study will be conducted through in-depth interview and focus group discussion. So here are the objectives of the study. The study aimed to determine the traces of ATOS a judicial institution in the Lupon of Talubin Bontok Mountain Province. Specifically, the research aimed to determine the public administration practices in the Lupon, such as the processes 
in implementing in the loophole and the processes in evaluating paralysis in the loophole. And secondly, to determine the judicial practices in the loophole, which, in, which includes the judicial practices on conflict resolution in the loophole and the judicial practices on imposing sanctions in the loophole. Now let's move on to the methodology of the study. Population and local of the study. Basically, the researcher utilized purposive sampling and referral method. The participants are the current five members of the Lupon and three barangay officials since they are involved in public administration and judicial practices in the barangay. The inclusive criteria is that base, it is based on their current role as the mediators and arbitrators of dispute settlement and conflict management. The data gathering tools that was utilized is intensive individual interview and tungtungan, which is contextualized focus group discussion. Data gathering procedure. So basically, the first step that must be done by the researcher is to secure a validation of the questionnaire or the interview guide that, was, that must be utilized and then an approval by the dean for the conduct of the study is also necessary and then proceed to the ncip clearance meaning the researcher must secure the approval of ncip for the conduct of the study since the study involves indigenous groups indigenous communities and then after we secure the approval of the ncip will now proceed to giving a letter or delivering a letter to the barangay captain for the approval of the conduct of the study within the barangay. And we need to attach also non-disclosure agreement form and confidentiality of the information that can be gathered while we are gathering the data. And it is an advantage on the part of the researcher since he belonged to that barangay. That's why communication through their dialect is um, not so hard for him and we need also to have an interview since uh, we need to secure all the necessary informations for the interpretation of the data that was gathered and then finalize the findings and after we finalize the findings we gave a copy of the findings to the NCIP and also discuss the data or the findings to the barangay. Treatment of data, thematic analysis was utilized. Basically, we need to find the significant responses, get the common idea, create a teams based on the common idea, and also we utilize context analysis, which is the presence of specific meaning within the responses of the informants. Ethical consideration, we, the researcher followed that. Privacy and confidentiality of the participants is expected. Expect a certain level of anonymity. Informed consent was delivered. Informa informants in a study have a right to know enough about the study in order to decide whether they want to participate in the study. Results and discussion. So under public administration practices in the Lupon, here we have the findings on the processes in implementing policies in the Lupon and the processes in evaluating the performance in the Lupon. So this is the simplified process in implementing policies in the Lupon. Here we have the combination of legal processes and cultural processes. So under the, the under the um, local government code we have review by the barangay captain it is actually the implementation of policies it must be reviewed by, by the barangay captain and then once the policies are approved then posting of ordinances in the barangay hall so that people must know what are these policies being implemented by the barangay however um, one of the cultural processes that was implemented in the barangay is the house-to-house -house information drive by the barangay tanod. 
to make sure that the community will be fully informed by the ordinances that are being implemented by the barangay. The processes in evaluating the performance in the Lupon, there's only one process that was um, um, find out by the researcher, which is the observation and evaluation by the barangay captain. So here, under the observation and evaluation by the barangay captain, um, the performance of the Lupon will be evaluated through their contribution to the discussion during conflict resolution and their skills and abilities in articulating their ideas in public on how they argue on the matter related to conflict resolution. So basically, those are the factors that will determine the performance of the Lupon members. Under judicial practices in the Lupon, we have judicial practices on conflict resolution and imposing sanctions in the Lupon. Here we can see the phases of conflict resolutions in the Lupon. So before the hearing, one of the main factors that we need to determine for the continuation of the conflict resolutions in the Lupon is the willingness of both parties to participate on the conflict resolution process and once they part they are willing to participate will now proceed to the occurrence of the hearing which is mediation through private council conference and here the council will let the parties have their sapata or what we call um, taking an oath but more religious in nature. And then we have arbitration through public hearing. So after this, after this phase, let's now move on to the post hearing, which determines the compliance of both parties. That's why they have the written agreement and the sapata that they must comply on what have been decided or agreed upon during the mediation and arbitration and then the penalty imposed to the offenders. And then we also have the judicial practices on imposing sanctions in the Lupon. It is um, divided based on teams, written agreement and penalizing the offenders. So basically, the judicial practices on imposing sanctions in the Lupon is based on sanctions which will be given or will be dictated by the Lupon members. They are the one who will decide what sanctions will be given to a certain individual, specifically the offenders. So under customary practices, it can be monetary, non-monetary, or community service. When we say non-monetary, it involves livestock, chicken, um, pigs, carabaos, as a um, um, as a sanction to the offenders. Conclusion and recommendation. So, in conclusion, the barangay chairperson chooses the elders of Ato to be the members of Lupon because the barangay officials believe that elders are competent in fulfilling their role in the community based on their knowledge and expertise in, in customary laws. The responses of the informants of the traces of auto in public administration of the Lupon shows that the people have strong acceptance on cultural practices of the auto. The traces of auto in judicial administration practices and processes of Lupon were shown in conflict resolution and imposition of sanctions of the Lupon. In the conflict resolution practices and process of the Lupon, the study highlights Sapata and Tongtong -tong as a significant traces of Ato in the Lupon. So recommendation, the Lupon should have a defined jurisdictions over the nature of disputes that should be settled through mediation and arbitration and a clear delimita uh, delimitations on the role of the Lupon position of penalties to the violators of the ordinance. The Lupon should have clear repudiating grounds and procedure on the cases that were not settled even after 
the arbitration process. So that's the end of my presentation and thank you for listening. Again, I'm Alexander G. Kilip Jr. from the University of Baguio. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we have heard all four paper presentations under this panel, Indigenous Customary Law. As suggested by the theme, we have seen four different sets of laws and punishments which are consistent uh, with the customs and beliefs of uh, various Indigenous peoples. So these laws uh, and punishments may not necessarily be consistent with the written or formal justice system in the national and local level. Uh, however, these are nonetheless rules which are recognized, honored, and shared collectively by the communities or the ethno-linguistic groups. Okay, so um, we have received several questions already in our chat box, and I will be reading them one by one. Um, to our speakers, you may choose to open your camera so the participants can see you. All right, and for the participants, um, please do not be shy to ask your questions. If you wish to remain anonymous, again, you can send me a direct message with your question. And if you want to ask your question live, then just raise your hand and then I will recognize you. Um, right, okay, all right. So um, for the first question, this is for the first speaker. Okay, there, Dr. Galliardo, are you here? Hi, Ma'am Gracielle. Okay, I'm here. Papa. Yes, I am opting for ano, turning off my video because my internet connection is quite unstable right now. Oh, that's okay, po, Ma. That's okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. So this is the question that I got from the chat box. Um, when were the cases you have presented earlier settled? I'm wondering if these are recent cases. Uh, in terms of the cases I presented earlier, so they are... Um, Cases that were uh, gathered uh, gathered during the conduct of my study way back 2017. So based from, uh, it's not basically uh, during the uh, conduct of uh, participant observation, but I got those, uh, those cases during uh, the gathering of different literatures and primary documents coming from, uh, coming from those agencies that were mentioned earlier. So uh, from uh, Savior Museums and then, of course, uh, the conduct of initial interviews from these, uh, from these groups who were able to have these uh, research studies about the Higaonon Paghusay uh, mediation in settling uh, conflict resolution. So uh, for these cases, most of these cases are finished. Uh, they were done. Uh, and then most of them were settled. Uh, most of them were settled, uh, light cases uh, were settled uh, based on this paghusay uh, uh, represented by these Higaunon elders, but uh, there are heavy, heavy uh, cases like, for example, killings were in uh, barangay captain within uh, uh, the municipality or in the uh, locality uh, required the presence of these uh, barangay uh, officials. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Another question for you, for the first speaker, but I think this is also relevant for the other speakers. So if you think that, if you want to answer the question, please just um, do so. All right, so um, are there instances where the local government tried to intervene on the customary laws or other matters relating to their culture or tradition? And what is the reaction of the, uh, of the community? But this is directed to the uh, to the first presenter. So can we have um, Teresa answer the question first? Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, yes, there are already um, there were already um, evidences wherein uh, the local government uh, participated on this uh, on this uh, paghusay in meddling conflict. Uh, somehow, it's quite successful. Uh, it's quite successful. Uh, basically because uh, they were able to address, uh, they were able to address and settle uh, the conflict concerned on that particular case. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, for those cases where Ian um, participated, uh, both parties participated both by Higa Onon, uh, most of them, uh, there were no uh, participation of um, uh, uh, local government officials. Uh, 
uh, usually government, uh, local government official participated if there is none higaonon um, uh, participated in that particular uh, conflict. All right, so they did not experience any conflict conflict with the local government. What about the others? Uh, hello. Okay. Um, for our study in the Biag, um, there were actually cases when um, state uh, there was a conflict between the state and the indigenous uh, tradition, um, especially before the enactment of the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act of 1997. So there were cases, for example, in Salcedo, Ilocosur, as well as in um, what I mentioned earlier in the presentation in Santa Maria. But um, that's why we mentioned that the IPRA was really a game changer because it provided a legal backdrop that uh, stated na that these uh, uh, institutions are recognized. Now they have the the they should be recognized. And that um, as long as they don't violate uh, rules uh, regarding human rights and other... Um, Tricot. Yeah. So, so yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. This is actually related to a question directed to you. Uh, the question was, before the community adopted the term bodong, were there any cases that their rules were not honored by the LGU or by the community, which prompted them to adopt the term? All right, sir. Go ahead. Now, um, as far as the uh, our informants, the elders of the mem of the budong, um, I think there was none. Yeah, there was a, yes. Uh, my co-author said the co-presenter said there were conflicts, but uh, uh, the LGU, especially, they noted the uh, uh, governor Chavit Singson at that time. Um, the the provincial government was actually. Um, uh, supportive of their cause. So um, I think the only explanation that the Biag adopted the Budong word, which is uh, consistent in all the narratives of the elders as well as the officials of the Budong, was that uh, for registration, sec registration purposes, and for legality purposes, they perceive that using the word Budong would be to their advantage. Okay, so for registration purposes. Uh, as noted by my co presenter also, it is not related to Kalinga Budong, but they uh, have experiences of communicating with uh, uh, their partners in Kalinga. Uh, Kalinga, uh, members of Kalinga Budong sometimes come to Ilocosur uh, to participate in other uh, activities, but uh, that's I think that's the extent of the participation with the, the Budong or Biag in Ilocosur. All and, right, okay. uh, and if I may add, um, most of the activities before the establishment of Biag were uh, done within the you know, within indigenous uh, areas. So the, their authority was really recognized in these areas. So it was only during the um, establishment of Biag that uh, with the increase of the membership, that they uh, that the jurisdiction of the organization also uh, increased no? <clears throat> so. all right and kalinga is aware that they have adopted the the term Udong. okay so another question for the second uh, presenters i'm very interested in the complexity of the organizational structure of biag May I know if there are rules on membership or retainment of membership? For example, do members have to pay a certain amount to be considered as members, etc.? Uh, yes, yes. Um, as, um, the only way to be taken out from the group, for example, is to violate the rules. As long as you are a member, uh, the membership can be passed down to your family. Um, for example, I'm the first uh, firstborn in our family. I am automatic a member. But if I'm going to marry and establish my own immediate family, uh, I have to be uh, to apply for membership for the biag. But uh, as long as uh, my father is a member and I'm a sing uh, I'm single, um, I am already a member, automatic member of the biag. So um, the only membership process is to apply for 
uh, use the form and then pay some dues, monthly dues, etc. And participate, of course, in the rallies or the panan. The yeah, rallies. People rallies. Okay. All right. So let's uh, I have another question for our third speaker. Uh, for the inclusion of the in your in your in your in your conclusion, you have recommended that the lipit be included in the uh, teachings in the classroom. So for the inclusion of the lipit inside the classroom, do you think that this should be standardized? If yes, how? This is a question for our third speakers. The third presentation. Okay, I can see her in the uh, in the participants. I I am okay. Hello, ma'am. Come again, ma'am. Yes. All right. Um, I'll again, repeat the question. Um, for the inclusion of the lipid inside the classroom, or I think th this is referring to the inclusion of uh, teaching the lipid in the curriculum. Okay. Do you think yes. that this should be? implemented or standard standardized if yes um how okay uh nothing standardized ma'am just uh, just in their place they will teach uh lipid justice system especially in araling panlipunan only Okay. Uh, so then, all right, all right. Go ahead, director. Uh, with doctors, we usually discuss uh, justice systems, leadership in governance. Hello, okay. And uh, sometimes we we discuss uh, these things in our classroom. So, uh, as researchers. Uh, we wanted to uh, this uh, justice systems be part of our of our discussions, especially in history and social uh, social science uh, subjects. That's why uh, we are trying to uh, uh, have researches uh, with this kind of of things, history, uh, uh, customary laws, and uh, actually we are also. Uh, thinking of uh, having a research on another customer just like SACAB and everything. So, uh, parang i i ang tawag dito, uh, gusto namin siyang integrate in, in our discussions in, to, to, our, ano, to our students. And uh, in, 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 uh, in our experience, in our experience, from the upland municipalities do not know these things. So, parang, uh, it, it, it's just a, a matter of uh, uh, giving uh, ideas or lectures to our students from the uplands that in in some part of, of Ilocosur, eh, may mga ganito pa rin customary laws na kailangan sigurong ma-appreciate ng mga students natin. Not, uh, kahit na siguro, not from the upland municipalities, but uh, from uh, for the students na uh, uh, lalo na for those students who are majoring in social science and history. All right, thank you very much. Actually, most of the presenters here are teachers. So if you want to answer the question, contribute to this discussion. Good, uh, good afternoon, ma'am. May I yes, sir. give the answer regarding to the question, ma'am? Okay, okay, sir. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, regarding in the Department of Education, we use the contextualization and localization in our in the in those particular subjects which we could use the lipid justice system as an example in the integration uh, in such particular lesson like for example if there is uh is, uh, there is literary piece that we could integrate the lipid justice system um, we could use it as an example for integration in order that we could contextualize and give concrete example of that uh justice system okay thank you sir about the others this is actually um um oh, one of the questions that is most asked in the chat box so are these customary laws included in the curriculum of curriculum of dep ed or ched uh, in your locality in your school etc um and this is related to the question do the young generation still believe in the different customary traditional 
loss of the IP. So I'm seeing Sir Ryan raising his hand. Go ahead, po, sir. Um, I was a part of Ched for around five years. So if I may also answer that one. Um, I don't think uh, customary loss is included in the curriculum, but as uh, our um, co-panelist from DepEd said, uh, you can, uh, the teachers have the uh, freedom to include and contextualize these laws for discussion. As far as I know, it's not included formally in the curriculum, uh, current curriculum, but they can be discussed. And um, schools can actually include the GEs or general education subjects pertaining to this, like it, like what we have in UP Baguio. The, um, I think, hindi ko alam kung nandiyan pa, yung uh, History 3, Indigenous, uh, History of Indigenous Peoples. So, pwede pong ganun. No? Yan. Thank you. Yeah, this Hi, is that still being taught in UP Baguio. Yes, uh, sino po yung sorry? Uh, if I may add on okay, the okay. question given, uh, in UP Mindanao, we have this GE course on Mindanao Studies 1. Although um, customary laws of uh, the uh, indigenous people is not really part of the curriculum, but I integrate, uh, integrate a discussion on these customary laws uh, for my students in Mindanao Studies 1 for them to have the uh, grasp on uh, these customary laws. At least somehow uh, they will be able to remember and then to know uh, that this customary loss still uh, exists as of uh, this uh, period. So, I am. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, what about the first question that's related? Or, or do you want to answer the question, po, Sir Alexander? Yes, ma'am. Um... Okay, po. I'm also teaching in the senior high school department and uh, um, I'm on social sciences subjects. But basically, um, I agree with the other um, presenters. Wala po talagang subject that is related. Actually, there is no specific um, inclusion of customary laws that are being taught by the students, uh, to the students. However, um, teachers have the freedom to at least uh, twist some of the topics in the curriculum in the senior high school so that uh, as much as possible maging aware yung mga students on the customary laws in that area. Um, there are discussions on the judicial system, the uh, Philippine government, um, some laws related also on the local level. However, wala masyadong natatakal. And on the question earlier on whether aware ba ang mga bata regarding sa mga customary laws natin, I think that is one of the main problem right now. They are not involved. Um, karamihan sa kanila, hindi nila alam yung mga customary laws. That's why in my paper actually, I discussed there na one of the reasons kung bakit nagkakaroon ng conflict between the customary laws and yung um, national laws natin or local laws natin primarily because the, uh, the succeeding generations right now don't believe already on our customary laws. They rely more on um, national laws na meron tayo, yung mga institutionalized laws na meron tayo. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, time check po muna natin. It's 12.21. So I will just um, entertain this last question. And then if you have further questions for our speakers, then you can direct message them through the Zoom meeting before the meeting ends. All right, so I think um, I would need Sir Manuel to elaborate on his question, but the question in the chat box sent to everyone was, in determining jurisdiction of the customary justice system as allowed, could they take cognizance on complex cases when the parties submit? Is, is, Sir, is Sir Manuel here? Ma'am? Yes, do you, yes ma'am, may I? Yes, okay. yes ma'am. Thank you very much for that, ma'am. I appreciate your recognition. Uh, my question is actually to, the, to our speaker who talks about customary justice system. My point is, uh, how about if the parties submit a certain case that determines by this justice system outside their, outside their jurisdiction, in what manner could they still rule on that? And the parties persist. To be within that, uh, to be within, to be tried within that, or to be identified, or how do you call this one, to undergo the process within that justice system. 
but the but the, the party or the customer justice system determine it not to be parang ganun. Could they still rule on that? Thank you very much. Bro. Okay, thank you, sir. Maybe this can be answered first by our second presenters because there's it's this is about um going beyond the boundaries of the jurisdiction. Yes, ma'am. Okay, sir. Um maybe I'll try to answer that in uh two know, two ways. Sir. Um first in the in in the idea or the principles of alternative dispute resolution. Um it's the parties that determine the 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 mediator so it's the system kumbaga that will adapt to the needs of the parties second in the case okay in uh, in another way no in the case of the budong um the budong actually talks to the parties and co uh, coordinates with the barangay the police so if they are not able, if the case is not within their, uh, their jurisdiction or their capabilities, um, they coordinate, they talk to the, party, the parties, they coordinate with the police. So it's um, the, the budong or the biag system in Ilocosur is an open system. Kasama po lahat, no? yung um, police and uh, other parties, yung barangay. So um, at least in our case, na pag-uusapan yan, na i-relay sa yung kaso sa proper parties kapag hindi kaya i-handle ng biyag. So, uh, yun po yung case naman ng budong. Or biyag pala. May I add on that? Go ahead po. Um, to the question of Sir Manuel, in the case of Ato and the Lupon in Bontoc Mountain Province in general, basically, um, if you try to look on the provisions of the local government code and the IPRA law, you can see there the um, limitations on how this indigenous um, judicial system really applies to the people. However, the question right now is um, if they submit on the process of indigenous laws, then the, in, um, the elders for, for uh, in our case, or the groups, the ATO, who really tried those kinds of cases, really um, can accommodate them. They are the one who will settle the disputes. But if one of the parties uh, don't want to subscribe on the customary laws, that is where nagkakaroon na po ng conflict, um, doon na subscribe na po sila sa ating judicial system, sa mga korte natin. And yung mga instances na ganun, um, yung mga complex cases na tinukoy ni Sir kanina, like for example, it's not really complex, pero yung mga grave cases na hindi talaga, na na-mention sa ating batas na kailangan talagang pumunta sa korte, like for example, murder, yung mga ganong mga instances, kailangan talagang may hub, kailangan talagang mapunti, mapunta yan sa korte. But in practice, um, based on sa mga naririnig kong mga kwento ng mga matatanda and in the community itself, May mga instances na they don't really, um, hindi na nila dinadala sa korte. Kahit na murder yung kaso, halimbawa may, may pinatay, may mga ganun, hindi na nila dinadala sa korte. They settled it already in within the community and hindi talaga siya binabroadcast. It's so like for example, hindi ko siya na-mention sa, sa presentation ko, pero may mga instances na for example, may pinatay yung isang tao, ang kanyang punishment is ibenta yung kanyang, ibigay yung kanyang ari-arian doon sa pamilya ng namatay or yung kanyang fields sa, sa namatay na yon or magbigay siya ng um, pera para kung may anak man halimbawa yung naging biktima, kailangan niyang, yan, mga, mga ex, uh, alternative dispute resolution na na uh, based nga sa sinabi ni Sir kanina. Alright, maraming okay. salamat po. Hello, right? Yes, ma'am. Sa lipit, ma'am. Uh, for example po, sa lipit, uh, yung offender po ay taga ibang barangay daw. Mayroon din pong coordination between the two barangays. And then, uh, pag-uusapan nila kung ano yung dapat nagawin. Pero mayroong limitations dahil kung masyadong grabe yung nangyari, for example, rape o kay murder, hindi kinakaya ng barangay officials yon at sa mga panglakayin. Kaya ang ginagawa nila ay dinadala nila sa Philippine National Police. 
yun po yung salipit. Oh, all right. Okay, so meron tayong mga similarities kung paano nila hinahandle yung mga cases ano, and how they coordinate with the LGUs and the other um, parties within the community and outside of the community. So that's all uh, of the questions that we will be able to entertain for this session. Maraming salamat po for attending the morning session of CS3.